Hey, this is John Reed. I am on the ground with Brian Summer. We're doing an old school podcast. Brian, how you doing? Pretty good. We haven't done one of these in a while, particularly one yeah. at a remote location. And because you can't see where we are, we're actually looking out over this incredible marina view here in San Diego. And why are we in San Diego? Because we're here at the Planful User Conference. Indeed. Planful performed 2024. We are on the, the second whirlwind day. Had a major keynote yesterday, some news announcements. And then today, right after this, you're going to be blasting into an ESG talk for the assembled finance professionals. So at the second part of our podcast, I want to get into ESG because you've spent a lot of time on that. And it gets lost in the AI noise, but it's an important topic. But before we do that, I want to talk just in general about what we've learned so far, because we talked to a bunch of customers, we heard the announcements, but roughly speaking, like, how do you think about Planful as a vendor? Like when you think of them and you talk uh, with customers, what do they have to offer? People are going to look at them usually when they're considering other, um, you know, I know they don't like the term enterprise performance management, but you know, if no. you're looking for budgeting, planning, consolidation tools, you're going to be looking at Planful, probably one stream, uh, maybe an Anna plan, uh, or some of the ones that are already embedded in different uh, ERP packages from vendors like Oracle Workday and so forth. So, um, you know, this is a product, or these are products that are sold almost specifically to the office of the CFO or the controller. Uh, they're there to make life a whole lot easier for the staff, accountants, and large, large to even medium-sized corporations. In fact, I talked to one company yesterday that clearly was a mid-market company, and they must have... Um, 20 odd different uh, g uh, locations in different countries around the world, they, uh, which means they need to do a lot of reporting in different uh, fiscal currencies or financial currencies, excuse me. Uh, they have different units of measure. They have different accounting standards. They have to meet all these different localities. They're paying payroll taxes um, everywhere. Uh, they're trying to roll up multiple different kinds of sets of books and on and on and on. So when you have that kind of complexity, you need a tool. Otherwise, you're going to drown in spreadsheets. And that's, I think, when people pick up the phone and call their friendly rep from a company like Planful and go, we need to talk. Right. And, you know, Planful, of course, had a lot to say on why they think they excel versus the other vendors you mentioned. But that's not going to be our focus today. I, I personally think that here's a few interesting things. I think that Planful provokes a conversation around finance transformation, which I think is interesting. And they're also looking really hard at collaboration, which is a really interesting topic around that. And so, for example, Planful has a lot of capabilities now around workforce planning, which implicates mm -hmm. HR. And they also do quite a bit with with marketing for CMOs. And so... It's the notion of tying those uh, lines of business back into finance on a more granular level that I think is pretty interesting. And then, of course, the cloud-based aspect, I think, is interesting, too, because you look at these multi-year transformations that no one really has a stomach for right now. And so these types of solutions are interesting because you don't have to upgrade and transform all your transactional systems in order to start, in theory making better decisions, you know, shortening some of those admin cycles. I think that's the underlying argument, right, that a vendor like Planful is going to make. Yeah, and I don't think, um, I don't think that things, that messaging is at all misaligned with what customers come to buy. I right. mean, they really are struggling with uh, problems. And the classics right now is that in the world of finance, you can't get people to get accounting degrees in colleges and universities in North America much anymore. The number of professionals who are leaving the accounting profession, it's just growing and they're not getting replaced at the same rate they're departing. So there's kind of a skills drain. There's a lack of skills and talent. And if you will, the war for talent in the accounting and finance area is far from being solved. So if there's any problem that a finance individual leader has, it's they don't have the people, so they need to turn to technology to backfill 
for that, you know, lost capability. And even some of the things we saw here at the show, you know, some of the tools that are, that can analyze and, you know, and uh, notate financial statements and the like, and financial reports and briefing books and what have you, those are all intended to save um, staff accounting personnel uh, dozens, if not hundreds of hours of time every month, quarter, year, and so forth. During a two-hour keynote yesterday, Planful announced a bunch of stuff. Obviously, there's an AI piece to this that we can get into, uh, and they're offering some free access to their Predict products, which uh, the last few years have been products that you would like pay for, but it's basically a free trial scenario. Um, I want to save AI for a sec, but they, they announced a bunch of other stuff too. Um, and they're, they're deepening their capabilities around workforce planning because they've had a lot of success mm -hmm. there. They announced their solution marketplace, which is essentially, as I see it, that the next step towards engaging partners around building solutions on the Planful platform. So I think they're opening with something like 15 um, apps there. Was there anything else that kind of jumped out at you that the keynote was kind of a whirlwind of various announcements and stuff, but... Yeah, and I'm looking at my notes, and they're in the order which we heard things, not necessarily right. Uh, any prioritization here. Um, there, there was some, you know, the CEO Grant Halloran. He talked about the business of Planful, and he commented that business was doing fantastic. That they grew, they've grown handsomely. They're profitable. Uh, they're investing in thing, you know, in products. They expect to have about 700 employees by the end of the year. They're doubling their development team. Uh, Q1 bookings, he mentioned, were 40% year over year. So, you know, that's the, you know, that's about as specific as you get from a privately held company. So that's the, all the numbers I have to share with you. But um, that, you know, that at least gives you something directionally to understand kind of where they're at. Um, the other thing they talked a little bit about was they're adding more capabilities for integrating Planful with other technologies, other software packages and tools. Um, one of what that they showcased in the keynote was a new connection with Snowflake, right? Uh, which is indicative of how they intend to help customers who have an abundance of data that needs to be, you know, plowed through. And this is going to be very crucial for companies who really want to get a more accurate forecast on operational matters, uh, uh, because those are the ones who are going to be plowing through everything, whether it's weather data, sensor data, uh, point of sale, cash register, transaction data, whatever, you're going to want some kind of capability uh, to handle huge, honking huge data, not big data, but I mean, spectacularly big data. And Snowflake will be the answer there. Yeah, and I had a talk with the chief product officer uh, about that too, and they were talking about how a lot of customers have, they found have had Snowflake in place because 40% of their customers are enterprise now, and and yet in a way that, that could be too much data for the Planful system, and so they've kind of figured out like what really needs to come out of like a Snowflake type of environment into mm -hmm. Planful. So part of that is, like you said, so much of, the discussions here with customers came down to this whole thing around like how do you how do you make better decisions amidst everything you're dealing with and how do you cope and you know one customer i talked to was talking about more aggressive planning cycles that they got into in COVID when they were trying to do a bunch of what if scenarios when the, a whole bunch of scenarios were on the table so it seems like that kind of announcement helps to further that and then also i think you were probably going to get to the there was a power bi um, integration right. that was part of that too. So anyway, another, tying into different platforms that are commonly used by customers was a big focus. Yep. You want to talk AI? Yeah, let's talk AI. And I want to get back to the maturity model stuff they discussed too. So I'll get to that when we get to the final section. For uh, what were your impressions of AI and what they brought up here? Well, as you know, I've not even heard AI mentioned at any user yeah. conference for the last two years now. Real and shocker, huh? Yeah, it, it was uh, it was eye opening, you know, because John, I've I just wasn't aware of the truly transformative power behind generative AI and yeah, auto magical capabilities. Yeah. Um, so I'll spare everybody, you know, the usual kind of things. Um, 
what now over hype bullshit for the podcast listeners. Come on, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, I do have a running list of the superlatives you need to use in an AI conversation, you know, and how every vendor is uniquely, uh, set up to right. harness the full power and potential of generative AI. But, uh, now some of the things I noticed as they were doing a demo in the keynote yesterday morning, it looks like they have a chat interface available so that you could talk or type whatever into their utility and it will start bringing forward data or synthesizing information for you, whatever. What would be an example of something that you would ask it? Well, you could, um, it could already have access to, let's say your, uh, full set of financials and right. you can ask it, um, show me things where variances are, you know, sh it, it, you're asking it to give you examples from the anomalies that are out there. Right. But also you could ask it, how do we improve our free cash flow, for example? And it could tell you, give you suggestions about staggering the, um, either certain purchases or, you know, slow down some payments or whatever. Yep. Um, and. You know, that's the kind of stuff that, um, drives, I think staff accounting people nuts is it's, it's a slog just to prepare the consolidated financials. And then, you know, more than yeah. get them done and somebody's starting to, you know, look at, you know, month to month, uh, kind of comparisons, whatever. And then the poor staff are then bogged down researching all kinds of variances and trying to explain what's going on. If, if only to have a tool that helps you get maybe, let's say 80, 90% of the way through that kind of stuff, um, would be a godsend and a productivity boost for people. Uh, I can, and this kind of points to another sort of undercovered, um, you know, area it's that people other than finance will probably start using this tool. You could see it having applicability with, um, sales and operations. You mentioned already marketing and others, um, wherever there's data, there's going to be a need or a desire for people to want to use these AI tools to better understand what the data is telling them. So one thing I really liked about the tone that Planful set on AI yesterday in the keynote was you know, and Grant's been, the CEO, Grant Halloran's really consistent on that, that the commercial sort of GPT models we think of are not fit for finance and that there's still a big hallucination problem and things like that. And, and Planful talked about its guardrails, but one of the fascinating things about finance is, is that in AI is that accuracy can really vary in terms of the need for it, right? So if you're doing projections, your your goal might just be to have better projections than your humans can do, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have 80% or whatever, and that's where your humans are getting, like, fine, maybe it's a little better, uh, or, or, you know, but, you know, and I think a couple of them said things like, but when you're filing your quarterlies or whatever, that accuracy tolerance is zero. You can't have any problems. And so even within this domain, you have a wide scope of use cases. And I think they put a lot of thought into like which ones can go ahead, which ones need human supervision, um, and just making sure that when they go forward with this, they don't leave customers exposed with scenarios that just are not accurate enough for what they need. So, so. let's go, let's drill into that just a little bit more. The, I think this point you're bringing up about year for many, many years, what would be acceptable, uh, in the past about you know, planning and, you know, for, uh, accuracy or forecast accuracy, it's continuing to change. And that's because, uh, smarter firms are able to bring in a whole bunch of additional data sets, but what they're creating is a, a huge large scale polynomial, you know, multivariate kind of equation that they're trying to optimize. And the problem is a human being just you know, unless you're Sheldon Cooper on the Big Bang Theory, you, you have, you have only the ability to capture a couple of different kind of variables that you can visualize, control, and understand the interaction relationships they have with others and how that affects the result. Some of these models are looking at hundreds of variables simultaneously to solve them. And what companies are able to do is to get forecast more closely you know, more closer to the 
two, three, maybe five percent uh, variance from what the company's actually going to get. And that's because there's always going to be some unknown variable that probably slips into the process that was not accounted for in the um, solving, you know, polynomial equation. So that said, I mean, that's part of the reason I think there's interest in these tools is because the old forecasting and planning methods just only got you so far. And one of the examples they gave, um, which I thought was actually a really good one that everyone could relate to, it's, it's what is your headcount cost, which is why the workforce management tool yep. uh, is, is popular. Uh, because there's so many other factors in figuring out what does it cost me to, for example, hire one more person because they're, whether when their benefits kick in changes the forecast, uh, because some things like health insurance may not kick in automatically from the beginning or how much something of a reimbursement somebody gets, you know, you don't, you know, there's just so many variables about like what time of year do we do raises? What will the raises be? And all those things affect that, those kind of calculations. And it's hard for a single human being to crank that out and do it accurately and then be expected to do it almost in a continuous basis because that's what companies want. They don't want an annual budget. They want a rolling one that's always being updated. So this is a, this can be a huge error avoidance and productivity time-saving kind of capability for companies who use it. Yeah, I had an interesting talk with um, a couple of folks from Planful, uh, Steve Welsh and Ben Page around this because I was asking them like, why that they thought the AI forecasting has been performing better than than the human forecasting and in their solutions and for those that have used it and they they talked about how hum, in addition to the points that you brought up that humans can bring their biases and assumptions into the equation mm -hmm. and not even realize that they're doing it right and not even question certain things that organizations always do like we always provision this many employees during this season or whatever and um, I talked, so I talked to a customer about this too, and I think what the customer was interested in, like they're not using it yet, but they're, they're interested in checking it out. They have some internal processes they want to kind of get set in their sort of overall change plan around finance. But what they'd like to do eventually is have these hybrid models where the AI does some of the heavy lifting, but then the, the human finance folks come in and and look at those forecasts and, and look at what AI came up with and potentially make some adjustments. So what they'd really like is not necessarily a side-by-side -side comparison of here's what the humans think and here's the AI. They want more of a, a hybrid model, but, but these kinds of things are interesting because then I think that's the kind of AI conversation I find interesting, which is take the strengths of both mm -hmm. instead of saying, oh, well, AI can do this now and, but, but find ways of fusing them into the same process to make people smarter at what they're doing. And that was really appealing to the customer. I talked to about this. That was interesting. So I did a talk probably six, seven years ago, and I was showing an audience of accounting professionals how you could use big data to do a better job of planning and forecasting every single line item on the P&L. And when I started the talk, I could tell you the audience was like, oh, bullshit, you'll never be able to do that, you know? And or why would we want to do it? You know, what we're doing right now with a spreadsheet's good enough. But I was going through this stuff and I'm going like, okay. So if you were vacuuming the social sentiment of um, your company as well as your competitors, anytime you can experience like a 1% or excuse me, like a one-star rating improvement on like your TripAdvisor or Yelp ratings or whatever, that generally correlates to about a 12.8% improvement in top line revenue. And I go, so where was that data when you were planning, you know, your forecast and doing your budget and forecast for the next year? And, uh, and I just kept going down and down and down the line, you know, and some of the trickier ones were around the people co you know, cost. Yeah. But, uh, I was showing how if you were using big data to, uh, and the tools to go with it, to do a better job, you could, you could get a level of, I don't want to say precision because that, you know, these are still guesses as to what you're going to get, you know, produce, but boy, does it really, um, shine a bright light on what's really, you know, the drivers back there, as opposed to just calling up and bugging 
all your salespeople, you know, asking each one of them, well, how many units do you think you can sell next month or next quarter, whatever? So, uh, yeah. And that this is similar to what this customer is talking about too, where that one of the things he could see the benefit for AI and that type of forecasting would be to, they have trouble calculating the human cost of their seasonal like variances when they have peak seasons and, and, and plugging all that in there. And in theory, the AI could just kind of take the past, requ you know, requirements and kind of plug that in. Right. And that would give you some basis for then figuring out, okay, how do we need to tweak this for this year based on, like you said, big data trends, maybe consumer spending is down a bit because of inflation concerns or whatever. So you mm -hmm. tweak your past seasonal needs or whatever, but it gives you that baseline. So I thought those were like pretty informed discussions that I find refreshing because I'm r really, as a lot of people know, I really hate the hyperbolic aspect of these things, but it was nice to hear some kind of get real discussions where people could see the benefits, but they weren't. I, I felt like they were looking at it like one other tool and not to be overlooked is a bunch of other stuff they can do. So let's just segue into sort of whatever you heard from customers is our final section of this wrap. Because one thing that I thought was interesting that I heard both on the keynote stage from Chosen Foods and also from a customer I talked with was like, when you think about benefits, like, oh, AI is awesome or whatever. And it's like, what they were excited about was some of the granular um, planning they're able to do with Implantful now, where on the stage they talked about doing it on an S on a skew level, level yeah. and then this customer was talking about how they can do it on a project level and then within the project components they're starting to break it out they're excited about that so i think it's funny because everyone's like oh ai this ai that and it's like well actually here's what's moving the needle for customers it's not always the same i would agree i, I think every company is going to come to its own uh whatever crossroads at some point when they're going to want to a, a uh, adopt some kind of AI technology and the question is going to be, and where are they going to put it? And I think every company has different needs. It's kind of like, uh, for those on listening on this, if you're a parent, you'll realize if you've got more than, you know, one or two kids, you, you notice that every child has its own particular needs, wants, and things. And one, one of the things as a parent, you want to try and give them the tools they're going to need to be successful in life. And I think that's what, what I'm noticing with some of the customers here. They're not, a, they're not all of the same like mind and they have different problems uh, that they need to solve in their own companies. And they're going to approach these AI decisions in their, their own timetable. I don't think they can be sold on AI. I think they're going to be convinced of what it can do for them in certain areas when the time is right. Yeah. And finally, just one quick, more quick thing on AI. I, I always look at vendors and where I think they've excelled versus challenged. And I think like my view on Planful is they're still trying to figure out the pricing aspect for to ease adoption around AI. Mm -hmm. um, historically, they charge for the predict solutions. Now they're looking to um, give some free trials. And, and I think they're, and Grant, the CEO admitted that they're still looking at some of the pricing for some of the A, built-in components, like the, the sort of, you know, call it a chat or a co-pilot or, you know, planful AI or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I do like the explainability stuff. That, to me, stood out on Planful's side from what I've seen from other vendors where, uh, you know, when, when you were describing those scenarios you could ask, it was telling you where it got that data and, and how it okay. came to that decision. I thought they had done some really good work there. Now, granted, they're not working with an LLM there, and that's one of the reasons why I talked with the CTO about that. That's one of the reasons why they're able to give more explainability is it's not LLMs are the ones that really have the explainability problem. So, um, but anyway, there, the point is that Planful is not doing the typical excuse making of like, oh, it's, you know, it's a work in progress. They're actually, I think, making some strides on being able to explain to the user, here's how we arrived at those decisions. And this is a big deal. I mean, there's, there's, there's lawsuits going on with publishers right now, partially because the search engines are not providing adequate explainability when they leverage content around AI. So explainability is a big trust factor and it's a big transparency factor. And I like that Planful is tackling that. Any, um, any f final reflections on just kind of what you heard from customers here and where you think this is all headed or? So it was interesting in the middle of the day yesterday i ran into some customers who you mentioned their uh predict product and um 
I asked him, were they using it or whatever? And the, and the first couple of customers I got to, the answer was no. And then it was, it was more qualified to, well, not yet. I mean, they're definitely looking at it and it's really more, I think, a question of timing. On the other hand, I was at breakfast this morning and I in, inadvertently sat down at a table, uh, when the plantful exec showed up and the whole conversation turned to what do we need to do to start rolling out and using the predict technology? So it's, uh, I, I can tell this is predict is going to be a focus of some of their sales efforts here for the near term, whether they intend them to be that way or not. Uh, but it's seems to be the bright, shiny bauble that's got, uh, the interest of some of the customers and why, because customers can see the value. The value is, uh, abundantly clear when you look at, um, I think you and I both know that lots of people get enticed by new technology and then you find out the doubles in the details and whether it's getting it implemented or fully understanding some of these tools. And I think there is a learning curve there, not on the necessarily on getting them implemented. It's in actually understanding what these things are producing. So it'll be, it'll be heady times for co-pilot people out there who are, you know, double checking the work of these things going forward. For sure. And there's, there's obviously things that make all kinds of sense. Like with signals, you're talking with predict signals, you're talking about anomaly detection and right. what, you know, what, what, what overworked finance officer, you know, doesn't want, you know, some additional so-called intelligence scrutiny on their, on their books. Right. And, mm -hmm. you know, I talked to a customer who's really interested in that product, but feels they have some work to do internally on some of their data quality. And I think that's always the big lesson is you don't want to get a bunch of false positives because your own data isn't quite where it needs to be. But, but when you look at that, you're like, yeah, that makes total sense. The other thing I want to briefly call out Planful on in a good way is uh, a while ago, I wrote this piece to torment vendors. It was called attention vendors. Please stop the customer success hype train and Unless you have these six proof points. And I picked six of what I consider like some of the hardest things for cus for vendors to historically to do. And one of them was, was publish a public maturity model for customers uh, on, mm -hmm. on how they can evolve with the product and uh, in, in a very kind of detailed way. And Planful did that um, in, in an overview sense during the keynote, they announced right. this. Okay. And, and, and essentially it's, you know, it, it, the simplified version is uh, automation, collaboration, and then innovate, business model innovation is kind of the overall maturity. And, and you can kind of place all the AI and all the other stuff in that context of customers trying to move from different areas. And of course, they divided it into very, the, re, the one that they published, I think, for customers or that they're going to publish is very specific to different categories because you can be advanced in one area and not as advanced in others. So it's not like you have this overall score. But one interesting thing that, that the CEO, Grant, talked about was, um, was kind of giving customers a little bit of a hard time around you're, a lot of you are struggling on collaboration, which was interesting. And so I had a lot of good discussions at Planful Perform around the challenge of finance collaboration and what it means to, to start sharing data with other lines of business leaders, what it means to get them to start buying into the idea that, that they can tie this stuff back and work, work off of this and not off of their own numbers and not off of their own spreadsheets, but like kind of work in a more coherent, collaborative way. And Every organization has a different version of that, so there's no quick fix. But it, I really like that they publish that because it provokes the conversation around not only how do, you, how do you excel, but where are you getting stuck? So mm -hmm. anyway, I thought that was cool. So, Yeah, I like those kind of tools um, because you're absolutely right. It, the first question it, it provokes within a client of mine is they have to come to some agreement as to where they really are. Right. And I think... It exposes, there are some people who look at their current mess of systems, which from an outsider, looks like a really worn out pair of like tennis shoes with grass stains on them and holes in the bottom of them. Uh, and they're still in love with it because they're nice, soft and comfy. The problem is they're wore out. They need to be replaced. And you got to get people to at least step up and identify truthfully, where are we? And then... You can, once you know where you're at, then you can actually start planning out the, the journey, the destination, whatever, as well as the, uh, you know, where you want to be at the end of all this. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a, 
It's an interesting problem, and I confront it every single time when I'm picking up a new client. I got to I give them a a quick little graphic, and I go, "Tell me where you are on here." It's kind of like, "Tell me where it hurts." And uh, astonishing enough, if I, I'm in a room with ten people, eight of them will probably be very honest and give you the the real core mm-hmm. true answer. There'll be two of them in there that are. They're highly resistant to change and just don't see anything wrong with what's going on today. They're the ones that I always have to remind that nostalgia is not a business strategy and yeah. it isn't a technology planning me- mechanism either. Yeah. Well, He's, I think, I think that's a good place to, to wrap that because we are on schedule today. 